Good evening. As Kellyanne said, I'm Eliza Pennypacker. I'm head of the Department of Landscape Architecture. And it's great to see you all here. I'm delighted to share the reason that I am up here, which is, is all about Bracken. So our Bracken lecture series was endowed with the generosity of our longtime head, John R. Bracken, who led our department amazingly, in my opinion, from the 1920s to the 1950s. I don't know, At any rate, in his estate, Dr. Bracken graciously provided us an endowment to enrich our students' experience. So we began the Bracken Lecture Series in 1982, and each year we choose one fellow, a professional whose inspirational work is at the highest level, and that individual is awarded the Bracken Fellowship, the highest honor that our department bestows. And this year I'm very proud to say in case you haven't figured this out yet, the Jack Dangerman is our 2019 Bracken Fellow. The Bracken Fellow receives a medal, you see it right there, designed by Penn State medallic artist John Cook. The front shows the corona of the mountain laurel, which is Pennsylvania's official state flower, its presence representing our commitment to our native landscape and to our commonwealth. Now, it's a good thing that it's projected up there because y'all can't see the real deal, which is right here. It's kind of nice. This makes a good paperweight. <laughs> yeah. With this metal jack, you join some illustrious company. We talked about some of them last night. Ian McCard, J.D. Jackson, Stuart Udall, Fritz Steiner, and Spurn, David Orr, and of course, Garrett Echo. We inside joke. <laughs> We're delighted that you are here and we look forward to your talk. Thank you so much. First off, I am deeply honored, actually. <laughs> I really am. And um, to join this distinguished crowd of people. Garrett Eckbo I knew quite personally. My family knew him quite well. And Ian I knew. Uh, I guess everybody except me. Well, what I guess I want to do is say that GIS and geodesign. How many of you think of yourself affiliated with this concept of geodesign? Some of you here in the audience? One third? Um, my sense have never been so important. So I'm going to talk about three things. First, give you some evidence of this that has never been so important and show what people are doing with these disciplines outside of the traditional domain. And I'll do that really quickly. Uh, second, I'll lay out a kind of concept of where I think this technology is going, and it's a big, it's a big idea. And third, I'll share a bit about the technology that my colleagues and I are developing. Is that okay, these three things? Yeah. <laughs> which of you like, okay, of the three, which one would you rather do? Examples or the theory and vision or the technology. So you get to vote. One, two, three. So examples of what other people are doing. Okay. Then um, vision of where it's going. Okay, and then the fundamental technology and what's going there. Wow, I got it wrong. I did it the other way around, but that's okay. <laughs> Look, it's gonna be uh, interesting. Well, first let me share with you applications and give you some evidence that this is an important technology. Basically, these slides that I'm about to show you are examples of people's work from all over the world that are applying the concepts of applied geography and GIS to different problems. And they fall in different categories. We'll start with environmental modeling and assessment. These examples show what researchers or planners or users or environmentalists are doing at sometimes the global scale. They're looking at, for example, deforestation in Brazil. Uh, they're looking at sea level rise and its impacts. They're looking at pedantic things like noise modeling in Switzerland. They're very worried about biomass um, assessments and on and on. Others are looking at natural resources, oil and gas, reserves, 
solar, forestry. They're looking at ecological um, dimensions of our, of our world. They're doing mining. They're exploiting the world. They're managing natural resources and using it as best they can. And sometimes these two different sets of applications are obviously in conflict. Conservation, environment, and extraction and development. They're both using the same information. Others are managing land information, parcels, who owns what. This is a kind of foundation for the civil society, property ownerships. We take it for granted in this country, but more than half of the world has no land cadaster or ownership boundaries. As a result, rule of law is in trouble. There's disputes. So this technology is used in defining ownership and understanding ownership. Some of it is just making the parcel maps, which is sort of what you would think. But look at these other examples, looking at appraisal, looking at history. In, in uh, Singapore, they're building the land cadaster underground <laughs> because they've run out of room. So it's a, it's a, fa it's a foundational data set. In the urban design and urban planning space, people are creating new towns, like this one extending in Abu Dhabi in both 2D and 3D forms. They're doing regional and, and urban planning, like in London. They're doing redevelopment planning in Korea, and just traditional zoning and transactional planning, like in Southern California. Others are doing conservation planning. They're looking at those hot spots that need protection. They're laying out plans. They're designing habitat corridors. And they're looking at all the fabric of geography, modeling it, coming up with plans. And yet others are going in the direction of putting into GIS's buildings or campuses or cities for visualization, for space management, for finding your way, for finding your way through a campus, something that I probably would have needed this morning if I were here alone. And these examples show the application of this technology in, in utilities and telecommunication. And some of it is definitely managing the assets. Where are the wires? Where are the power poles? Where is the distribution networks located? But other ones are giving us insights into real time what's going on. And in the area, area of 5G, a line of sight modeling is very important. So in the upper left hand corner you see people designing a network which is invisible physically, but yet is based on the ability to see around buildings or with buildings. And in the lower right, AR, augmented reality, is letting engineers see underground using the digital twin of utilities. Is this about the right speed? Are you following me, what I'm saying? I could go faster. <laughs> You'd be in trouble, but I could. Um, and in business, people are using GIS to get the geographic advantage for their business. Like people like Starbucks or Walmart or Walgreens or UPS op optimizing routing. People are seeing big visions in the private sector for how to develop landscapes. Uh, just like there are people that are trying to conserve it. In, <clears throat> in public health and in demographics, GIS is foundational. For example, the 2020 census next year, uh, geography, the new director says, is foundational to everything that they do. The collection, the enumeration, the aggregation of data, so that people make decisions from it. It's really fantastic in terms of spatial, visual decision making. And in, in public health, some of you I know are in public health or looking to public health, it is literally changing our understanding of disease spreads, epidemics, and shutting down major, major epidemics like polio, Ebola, 
measles, seeing things spatially changes our perspective. So GIS is credited with shutting down Ebola in West Africa a few years ago because they were able to set up quarantine areas and see as disease was breaking out how to put it into a box. Our world, our cities, are safer because people can now see not only where crime is happening, but also address it with real-time crime density, with predictive analytics, like uh, in that center thing, uh, where will crime possibly break out? It's not perfect, but it gives some indication. And little Sri Lanka uh, over off of India is showing real-time spatial temporal patterns of crime. Uh, and it's just changed how they do policing. Over in the left-hand corner, down at the bottom, you'll see the city of Philadelphia is looking at all the parameters that are necessary to figure out where to invest in more protection or more policing or more infrastructure. Again, it's a decision support kind of map. I'll come back to these because in some ways, these are all examples of spatial thinking and supporting decision making, like where to locate, where to address, like that. We are seeing in our planet increasing need for preparing for and responding to disasters. These are examples of, for example, migrant rescue in the Mediterranean. Um, fires in my state, we see the states burning down. And our governor, um, Newsom, perhaps some of you have read about him, he's amazing. He came and spent a day with me to figure out how he can get fires in a box. Is that interesting to me? I, I'm totally amazed that a man of that stature would do this. And homeless. How do we get homeless in a box? How do we deal with these substantive issues of hurricanes and disasters and, and respond to them? Now, an interesting thing is happening. I have millions of users. It's a huge responsibility. They buy little tools from me. They set up systems. They do work. And one of the big trends I'm seeing is these people are all opening up their data. They're put, putting it on the internet with trends of open data portals. Uh, but typically, open data is not enough. I mean, open data, what's a person, a normal person, do with open data? You know. Uh, but open services, like open maps that tell stories, are increasingly becoming prominent. Billions of maps are being made every day. Not just the Google Maps fly around like Superman, but I'm talking about maps that engage people. So citizen engagement through mapping is coming alive. And sometimes within organizations, complex organizations like cities, we're seeing the serving of maps from one department to another so they can mash them up and see the whole. One of the big promises of, of geographic thinking and GIS is this idea of putting all the pieces together again. So in complex organizations, portals and open data and this set of apps that engage people uh, is one of the big trends. Well, that's sort of enough of a profile do you get what this is about? I mean, it is, it is becoming pervasive. It's virtually touching every major challenge that we as a species are dealing with, from climate change to, to uh, little things, like uh, where to locate Starbucks. Fun. The second thing I'm going to talk about is what's next. Now, this is a perplexing question. And for each of you, it's going to be different. So I'll simply ask these questions. What's next for you as a person? What's next for your personal career? What's next for tomorrow? <laughs> but what's next for next year? Have you got it wired? What's next for you during your career? And some people, when I ask this question, what's next, they'll say, um, well, what's next for my family? Or what's next for those friends that I'm closest to? And another way to think about what's next is what's next for uh, 
Penn State or the little city here? Or what's next for Pennsylvania? Or what's next for the United States? Or what's next for the planet? Don't these ideas go in your head a lot? Like every day you open the paper, oh my God, that's gonna, what's, what he said was, you know, those <laughs> sort of things. So it's a provocative question, what's next? So coming from where I have come, my thought about what's next is that it needs to be more guided. And so the vision I want to share with you is the idea that, that GIS can be a kind of intelligent nervous system for our planet. Now, most of you know what a nervous system is. You all have one. You're humans. And they, of course, do stimulus response. You see something, you respond. But they're far more than stimulus response. Central nervous systems, meaning your brain, take in lots of information. They integrate data from many sources. What you see, what you hear, what you read, and then you integrate this data somehow. That integration process, we don't know exactly how to explain it, but we do it. And then we think about it. We use logic, reasoning, sometimes emotions, uh, sometimes ethics, and then, and then we respond. But we don't respond just stimulus response. It's not just one thing. We do coordinated response, don't you? Well, most of us do, except sometimes you do stimulus response. But the process is intriguing to me. And the world that you and I live in is, it resembles a kind of living organism. It's uh, full of life. Um, it's complex. It's a kind of ecosystem. Things are interconnected. And they also, it's all about self-healing, our natural environment heals itself as it gets into trouble, sometimes. And we would say resilient. It's a common theme that people like to use these days. It'll be resilient. That living organism's also always changing, and you and I are a big part of it these days. People describe it that we're a huge part of it. Now, thinking about digital technology, which I do a lot of thinking about, uh, it's if we look back in the last 25 or 50 years, it's, it's literally transforming our world. It's co-evolving with us as humans. Now, technology has always had this role. You invent technology, humans adapt to it or embrace it, and humans evolve. But with digital technology, it's accelerating really fast. I mean, it is really accelerating fast. And that has been fantastic for, for the privileged, for you and me, we live in an enriched world. I mean, it's just incredible what we have. Medicine, um, literacy, access to the world's knowledge, advancing civilization on all fronts. And, um, well, it's lovely to live at this particular point in history. Except that our little human footprint is creating massive challenges. It's, we're overpopulated. Some people say by about, um, well, several times. We are consuming the natural resources at a rate that's overextended. Some say about 1.7 consumption of the sustainable natural resources. And we see the evidence in this in climate change. We see the evidence in it in rapid decline of certain species. We see it in the evidence, uh, in the evidence in social conflicts and political debate. We see the evidence in inequality socially, globally. All these things people write about and talk about on evening news every day. Not good. And frankly, it's not sustainable. All the arrows are going in the wrong, bloody, friggin' direction. I'd use other words, but people would not like that. Not good. Our friend, Dave Sinman, would use other words. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he would have. He would have, yeah. Not good. So this is a dilemma. 
So each of you, I suppose, contemplate this in your personal lives, whether you have a family or not. It's a sort of like doom and gloom, uh, dismal uh, future. From my perspective, I believe that the world needs a kind of nervous system, much like the ones in our body, uh, an intelligent and responsive platform that senses, creates understanding, enables not just single response, but collaborative response, much like we do with our body, and an action. And for me, the science of geography is essential for this. I mean, people have talked about a nervous system of the planet for decades with the advent of the internet. Oh, that's the nervous system for the planet. But shit, it's full of crap. You know, you search something, there's, not any, there's no way to bring it together. But geography is a way to organize things. It's the science of our world. And here I'm not talking about geography, the discipline, like I'm not a geographer, or I'm not in the geography department, or like that. I'm talking about the broader context of geography, the science of our world. It provides content and a way to organize all of the content across the different sciences and across different organizations. I would say it provides a common reference system. It helps us see complexity. It helps us see the patterns and relationships and association it kind of brings it all together for me. And when I first saw that about uh, 52 years ago, I was like amazed. I could hardly believe it. I mean, each of you probably have had moments in your life when you all of a sudden saw things that you didn't see before. And at that moment for me, I thought, oh my gosh, it brings it all together. I could fly in an airplane and I could see context and content. I could model it in my mind. And uh, it was, it was a crit critical moment for me. Uh, and it also helps us understand, and with the advent of this new discipline of geo design, it helps us intelligently respond. We bring all of our design thinking, more about that later, into a framework that allows us to make action. So the, the diagram, it seems like my entire life I've been remaking, is this. <laughs> that in these six steps, we measure geography. We visualize it with maps or look at it in real time now with IoT. We do analytics, model, model processes, model suitability, model or interpret our measurements. We then make designs and take actions. We make decisions based on that fabric. It's like having it all brought together. And if we go back to the mind thing here, it's about sensing and understanding and then systematically responding, bringing it all together. So geodesign provides us a framework and a process, step one, step two, step three, a kind of foundation for this nervous system that I'm, I'm trying to sell you on. Do you like this idea? I need some feedback. You guys are asleep. Is it <laughs> me? I think it is. And he, he can see you. The lights are up. I know. I can see all of you. <laughs> and I will give you a test later. By the way, you sitting on the ground, you can sit up here. There's a dozen chairs up here. <laughs> Unless you want to do that. It's okay. <laughs> Look, when in most of my career, I've worked on this thing called geographic information systems. And <clears throat> this supported doing little projects on a desktop or in a mainframe computer. It involved doing the creation of systems. These are systems of record, like a system for utilities or a system for land ownership. These are like other IT systems. They're transactionally updated and maintained. They're like money systems or personnel systems or geographic systems. And systems of record are a fabric for not just administrative work, but also for science itself. We are, in, we are learning how to do survey measurements as a transaction on a database that other people can use instantly. The third step, which is what excites me most at this point in my career, is that these systems are starting to get tied together into a system of systems. 
This is done with web services and a portal which references the different distributed systems so that I can ask a question and it can go out and pull data together for me and weave it together using location um, to do the integration. This is a broad concept that I'm going to come back to again and again. So GIS is actually already creating geospatial infrastructure for cities. Little projects, little systems are being woven together creating a nervous system for cities. I'll show you a few examples in a minute. Connecting everybody and everything in the city and applying this science, the geographic science, to behavior or work in the organizations. GIS is also beginning, and this is just beginning, but there are millions of people doing it, are also contributing to global geospatial infrastructure. So look at the diagram. Little projects are being shared with cloud, into cloud machines uh, with internet connections. And little systems that run inside of a city or in a county or the Forest Service or a BLM or like that are being referenced into portals that can be searched and connecting the information. We can bring it together. This is sort of almost invisibly happening. So what is this actually, geospatial infrastructure? You can look at the icon, the thing in the center, and it shows a lot of distributed little computers. What it is, is GIS at scale. It's the same concept of overlaying different maps, but now the maps are living all over the place. And I can dynamically search and mash up data from distributed systems of record or little research projects that might be done by a graduate student here or you know, designing something like that. And that collective, that collective body of knowledge can be searched and accessed by an individual or a team. People in different locations can begin to team, sort of collaborative use of data and sharing it. Um, and also this platform is starting to open up and connect with communities. So through the power of mapping, something I spoke to some of you students this morning about, mapping is becoming a common language so that people can understand what's going on in government. They can look not only at charts and graphs, but they can see the patterns, where the investments are going on. So this whole thing is, is uh, going at lightning speed. What does it provide us? geospatial infrastructure. It means me sitting at a workstation or in a browser, I can connect with distributed, distributed capabilities on other people's machines. I can say, I want some AI done. Let me just send it over there and connect and get the results back. Or I can bring the data from different distributed machines into my machine and connect it. It's like I, <laughs> I have a hard time describing this. Anybody have an iPhone here? <laughs> Yes, or some, some people do. So I was always um, intrigued why Steve introduced this in a technical way. He described it as, this is a, it's got a cool camera in it. It's got, uh, I can do my email on it. Um, I can, you know, listen to music on it, all that stuff. He never got up and, you know, if I were him, thinking back, Chris, I, I would have got up on the stage and said, ladies and gentlemen, I just invented something that will allow you to look at the entire Library of Congress in your hand. You can get at access every piece of music, every piece of knowledge that has ever existed through this little device. What a difference. And this is nowhere near that impactful, or maybe it is. What I'm saying is that distributed geographic knowledge can now be accessed through this web services and brought together as maps and models assembling dynamically the geographic knowledge of, of millions. I'll come back to this a few times this morning, this afternoon. And there's some building blocks to this. How does this happen? The first concept is, uh, you know, there's an acceleration of data collection. So on the web now, I can read in BIM models, I can read in LIDAR, I can read in 
3D data. I can bring in topographic maps. I can read in imagery. I can read in unstructured data. I can bring it all in by leaving the data on the machines where it lives. If it's in Australia, just leave it there. But I can view it through an abstraction. Now that required the ability to do dynamic abstraction. That's a cool thing. Some of you will understand this, some of you won't. It's all right. Just get the concept of it, that I could actually bring to my fingertips data on every machine, and no matter what the data format is, I can turn it into a map layer, and I can overlay these map layers to look at relationships and patterns. So that's kind of the technical way that it's done. In other words, I harmonize dynamically the data. And some of the data can be real time. Like where are all the buses right now? Where are all the Uber cars? Those are sort of examples of single um, you know, views of maps. But imagine I could do that in software that allows me to integrate all of that and mash it up. It can integrate different kinds of models, landscape models, city models or sims. It could integrate zoning models or zims or bims. <laughs> I just made this up last night. I, thought, I hope you like it. Lim, Sim, Zims, and Bims. I got sick of the architects owning the show here. Not that they're bad, it's just you know different kinds of models. So I can dynamically integrate this data from many sources. And through that integration, I can feed apps for many kinds of individuals. I can look at uh, <coughs> doing GIS projects like I did 50 years ago. I can look at doing geodesign work, sketching. I can do data visualization. I can build dashboards. I can do data science. I can view this assembly of distributed data dynamically and put it into an app and disseminate that app to everyone. Now, again, those of you not in software engineering cannot um, grasp probably what this has taken the ability to integrate all data, harmonize it, and then be able to support in a simplified form access through any device, anywhere, anytime. And so this is just beginning. It's, the idea is not beginning, the engineering is done, but the implementation of it will steadily roll out. And more comments about that in a moment. One element of that is that maps will become pervasive. Not the Google map thing, fly around like Superman, who gives a damn. I'm talking about the real rich map related information that's authored by people that tell stories. And it, that language, that generation of language will mean a new generation of email. I would call it Gmail, but Google already did that. Kind of geography mail or map mail. It'll also mean that people can grab different data sets and explore them for their own community, for their own life. They can do simplified spatial analysis for, for just hunting for relationships. What's the, what's the relationship between breast cancer and the toxics off of Long Island? Just for fun, let's take a look. Is there anything there? In other words, be amateurs like what's happening in the astronomy community with amateur telescopes. Just imagine opening up all of the geographic knowledge to normal people and making it simple enough to do mashups and connections. It will revolutionize the way people think. And adding to that, let's, why not bring in all the new Earth observations, the hundreds of satellites in different resolutions? And why don't we add to that rich modeling for forecasting, like these flood models that are starting to emerge, and make that available through powerful visualization uh, displays that everybody can understand. Well, and why not also use that power, that thrust of available geographic data as the platform for doing geodesign? That's what this is all about. I mean, you know, measuring the data, making maps, doing models, that's all the science side. But turning it in the hands of designers so they can design more intelligent cities referencing the real-time data or design landscapes in various ways uh, is going to be very powerful. That will be for you. All this work has been done, speaking to the, those of you who are doing geodesign as a profession, all this engineering work has been done for you. 
and it's just beginning. We will see the ability to have geospatial green infrastructure defined here for the whole country or the whole world. Ed Wilson is, is one of my good friends at Harvard, um, biodiversity uh, person, and I are teamed up to map biodiversity for the whole planet. It'll take about four years, but it's going to be powerful. This is a, a mere beginning of green infrastructure that one of my colleagues, Hugh Keegan, I think shared here a few months ago. And he showed how this green infrastructure framework could be used for regional planning, local planning, urban planning, not just the technologies or the data, but the concept of it uh, will be there. So geospatial infrastructure is not about just your work, it's also about sharing your work and engaging communities, bringing people together. So what we're seeing is the ability to take geospatial infrastructure and put it out through maps and apps that are engaging to people. Oh, that's kind of fun. It's like playing a game. It's like playing Pokemon Go, um, except with real live data underneath it. So I see this is just, just beginning so that instead of urban governments run by bureaucrats, it'll be urban governments that, that promote that make available geographic data for, for citizens and they get involved. They get involved in their town um, in the same way that social media is involving everyone. Geo-social media will involve everyone constructively. Citizens, academics participating in you know, the, whole, the whole deal. So that's happening. Now, one last idea. This geospatial infrastructure and the concept of it with distributed data that's georeferenced and integrated dynamically will mean that different stovepipes of data, different separate databases can be dynamically integrated and interconnected in real time. And some of you will understand the application of these. This, others won't. Okay, let's take the university. Do you work well with all of the other research departments on the university who are doing work? Or do you keep your data quietly to yourself? I'm talking to some of the researchers here. Um, do you actually openly share it? Or do you work on your research and then maybe, maybe you'll give it away later? But imagine a world on the campus here that through the library which had a strong portal, which actually would reference everybody's work, every student's work, every researcher's work, the history of the collections of PhD theses that were here, and one could search and dynamically bring that data together to see um, in near real time how location could integrate data. In cities, we're already seeing this, the idea that different, different departments are sharing their information through portals. They're saying the police department, the fire department, the planning department, the zoning department, the et cetera, is making available their information as web services. And both across the government and also with the public, they are making that data available. This is happening with 137 departments in Abu Dhabi right now. It's one of the most interesting cities I've ever worked in. But it's also happening in a small city in South Carolina of 7,000 people. It's happening in Raleigh, North Carolina. It's happening in Los Angeles. It's happening in lots of cities. In Abu Dhabi, they're not only bringing the data together, but they're supporting the Executive Council with management information, geospatial management information, so that in real time, uh, transactions are made and responses are available. In Los Angeles, uh, the mayor there set up this hub for citizen engagement. And communities, instead of meeting in one big hall and then everybody getting confused, are organizing their um, engagements with the city through meetings, through maps and, and uh, initiatives. I'll come back to this in a moment. In New York City, they're wiring up the city as they're doing in Dubai and Singapore and Hong Kong, where virtually everything that moves and changes can be observed and mashed up 
So it isn't just the static geology maps. No, it's real-time sensors that are watching the traffic and watching people move. And in the UK, under the direction of the Ordnance Survey, they're wiring up the whole country so that as cars are driven, objects are observed, put into feature databases and accessible uh, through the services and orchestration of this amazing organization. What we're talking about is creating a responsive infrastructure that looks at changes in real time and allows integration in real time of the information. Now, not all of it is running fast, but some of it is. A couple weeks ago, I was in Indonesia. The little slide in the upper left is showing all in real time all the ships that are moving off the coast. And you can funny, see that funny yellow line. That's because of the, when was it, some miles out, fishing boundaries, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. So you can see it. And floods. Um, and then in the lower right, the UN, for their sustainability work, the SDGs, are wiring up all the different countries reporting their different indicators for, for, um, for the world and serving those through this portal so we can see a map of how we're doing, how we're doing with inequality, how we're doing with vegetation loss, how we're doing with agriculture. So this is, is, this, these are just amazing beginnings. So the second, I'll conclude my second part. The, the geospatial revolution, and somebody asked me about this earlier today, is it, where are we? Um, and where are we with respect to geodesign, this concept of linking science to, to design? I would simply assert that it's just barely beginning. And this nervous system and the work that emerges out of it will, I think, represents a, this work represents one of the very few things that I see going in the positive direction. It's creating the vision that one could have, actually have sustainable prosperity. A big notion. Is this, is this gonna just happen? No, it's not gonna happen. It's, it's the technology that enables it. But people like yourselves, and more specifically you, if you're serious about this, if you're wanting a life that actually matters, um, we'll get into it. You'll start to creatively think about it. Um, you'll envision what's possible from it, creating a, a more sustainable world. You'll share with each other. You won't be hold up academics. You'll collaborate. You'll engage with communities. You'll, you'll, you'll need a passion for driving this. It won't just show up. If this excites you, if this is, is something that inspires you, uh, then go all in. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. The third thing I'll talk about, which most of you didn't show very much interest, so I'll go pretty fast, is um, my work or my colleagues' work, actually. Uh, every year, we spend about $350 million on software development. That's a huge responsibility because we get all the money from our users around the world, and we have to spend it wisely. And every year, I give them a kind of, um, what do you call it, uh, a report on where we're spending their money. So I'm going to give you that report now. Or, or I could skip it. We could just stop here. What would you like? Are you sure? OK. How many would like to stop now? <laughs> You're just doing that to be nice, I can tell. <laughs> Okay, look, my, my, my colleague's work is wrapped up in technology. And you know, there's lots of technologies today. Google is a technology, Microsoft's technology. This is GIS technology, so it's sort of an inside track of some of the work we're doing. Some of you like it, some of you really don't care. But let me share what it is. It's building a system. It's actually three systems in one system. One aspect of the system is record keeping. It's like financial record keeping, but it's geographic record keeping. A building is built, a building is torn down. It's a transaction. Simple, right? A land is subdivided. This is a record keeping system. They call that a system of record. Vineyards are planted, vineyards are torn out. 
grapes are harvest, you know, it's like database transactions. And geospatial data tr transactions are complicated, they're hard to do. Uh, so there's a lot of engineering that goes into that. The second one is systems of insight. These are analytics or spatial analytics, like overlaying maps and seeing the relationships and making predictive models. And that's uh, interesting all by itself. Spatial statistics come out of that and others. And the last one is this idea of systems of engagement, where maps and apps can be used to engage people. And so wrapped into this one thing, we try to bring all of those three kinds of systems together so that you can actually engage people based on the system of record. Or you can do analytics on the system of record. Or you can do analytics and share it with people in systems of engagement. So, and it's just really rich. Complicating it is this little thing here in the center called real time, which means you know, you've got to do all of this record keeping and analytics, but you've got to now do it you know, in 3D rotating in real time. <laughs> it's, it's really crazy. So this is to describe that engineering of this fabric is not for the lighthearted. Um, and there's all kinds of replicas of pieces of it, but what we uh, work on is pushing the envelope with respect to keeping this thing all high performance all at the same time. And we make mistakes. I mean, we try this, we try that, we go a little further and then we don't, and it's a, kind of a messy process. These 50 years have been messy, and part of the reason why we've been successful is that we listen carefully to our users, and we have a total focus on helping our users do their work. These two combinations really have given us uh, success. So this system, because I'm a landscape architect, because I got started doing this top thing of gathering all this data and really wanting to do design, this is my passion, is this little, can we link on top of all of this amazing tech design tools uh, that allow us to sketch and evaluate alternative designs? That's, a, that, that's kind of... I mean, the people who pay for our work is the stuff down below. <laughs> and we sort of want, want with a passion to do geodesign apps. Okay, so lots of capabilities are advancing in this. You can glance through them and find your favorite. It starts with content. So in the last 10 years, we've collected in the range of $10 billion of data, other people's data, and put it together into a cloud system. There are now over 25 million data sets that have been organized just for you. Some of them are living atlas layers uh, for the whole planet, imagery for the whole planet, elevation for the whole planet. Not in great enough detail for most of your work, but um, quite a bit of good science is going on. Uh, and then there are millions of maps that have been shared in this cloud by our users. They'll make a cool map and they'll say, oh, I'm going to share it with others. I'll just load it up in the cloud. So if you want to find data, it's, you can do it in the normal way, but the digital discovery aspect of this for today's professional is pretty astounding. And we keep adding to it. Uh, this year we added the ability to do open street map in about nine seconds. So after somebody updates the open street map, it's available to people quickly because our Emergency responders want it. The new National Geographic base map, new imagery, new demographics, all of these seem to be coming along just about as fast as we can get them ready. Uh, they're consumed by someone. In the tools area, we've invented a lot of tools that do smart mapping. These are using machine learning tools to replicate what a great cartographer would do. This is no, no offense here to those of you who are cartographers in the room better work that you do, but machines are catching up. Now, I mean, color ramps, being able to visualize things in 3D and like that, a lot of progress is being made. Story maps are a kind of new language. I just got a note from uh, my colleague Alan Carroll who invented this technology. Um, they're making millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of story maps every day, and they went over the threshold of making storing in the cloud over a million map stories. So in a year from now, I think it'll be 10 million or maybe 100 million. 
as consumers learn this technology, and we've just released a new generation of it, people will build story maps of everything, their vacation. It'll become like, uh, like, a, like a email, story maps. Um, 3D visualization is very powerful. It keeps advancing. And with the integration of geodatabases into gaming engines and into AR and VR, we'll see the ability to engage people more, uh, more fully. Spatial analytics. This is the combination of data or analytics of spatial data. New forms of charting, new spatial temporal tools, new raster functions, improved big data handling, and what seems to be on everybody's mind, the world of, of, of AI and uh, machine learning to do feature extraction off of imagery, to do pattern recognition, to do incident prediction. We're seeing a lot of that now in the user community. And the integration of engineering tools with GIS, things like um, Civil 3D or Revit or BIM modeling, accessing and pulling into design engineering tools. It means that uh, the, the engineering and construction and um, build community will be enabled with the geographic knowledge that their colleagues in science uh, have built. So lots of solutions here. And more real-time operations bash dashboards are now, there's just hundreds of thousands of these that are reporting on, on virtually everything. Room temperatures, um, where the enemies are, where the, where the, where, where, what's the progress on the race, what's the, what's the traffic, what's the situation. It used to be that you'd buy one of these big multi-million dollar uh, rooms and watch, you know, like the president watches something. These are now commonplace. Even on iPhones, you can see, see uh, in real time what's going on. And speaking about that, this is an example of the kinds of apps that are being used across the community. Not only the dashboards, which are in the lower left, watching people in the field, but also location tracking um, and field data collection. Survey 123 and its corollaries are being used in the 2020 census here in the United States. Uh, the census that's going on in the Philippines, they're carrying one of these, they're doing the census dynamically. Or polio immunization in Baghdad recently, they were immunizing kids for polio and doing this transaction, it was going into the cloud and with a dashboard at WHO in Geneva, they were seeing the progress of the immunization. Wow. Isn't that cool? So this is what I was talking about, transformation. You do integration and transformation of organizations and work. So all in real time. And that's just beginning. In the area of imagery, likewise imagery is coming in, being served dynamically, analyzed, um, visualized, orthophotos are <laughs> becoming <laughs> almost there. Um, that's a joke for some insiders here. Um, and, and analytics, especially deep learning, feature extraction, watching what's going on. And it's becoming all real time. Sensor networks, the IoT, vehicles, assets, the environment, all of that's being wired up and rolled into real-time maps. They're no longer geology maps, they're real-time maps. We're used to this with traffic, but this notion of smart city means everything gets connected and is useful to the, to the geo designer or to the decision maker of various types. All right, so the big challenging work for my colleagues is to take these research concepts and technologies and wrap them into products. And we do that, it's called ArcGIS. It supports GIS markets. It supports the online mapping markets. It's supporting the location analytics markets. And most recently we've taken a huge interest in developers. So making, lifting up the hood of everything we do, open sourcing a big piece of it, and open APIs to access and allow uh, the sort of startup community to have access and start messing around with our tools.
That's the RTIS world that we live in. About three years ago, we also started building a new kind of system. It's not a GIS system. It's a geo-enabled system. And there'll be many of them built, but it's built with the content that's built with GIS, but they're geo-enabled systems for land use planning. A lot, of, a lot of land use planners don't, a lot of landscape architects don't want to know, <clears throat> they don't want to know GIS. <laughs> it's too damn much work. And it is work. I mean, you have to know this and you have to know that. They just want to do urban planning. So we have invented a new system called Urban to do that, and one for indoors and some others. But it's going back to RTIS. There's RTIS Online, this uh, massive system with, with millions of users. There's RTS Pro, which is a desktop tool that does project-based work, 2D and 3D. There's enterprise systems. These are big servers that allow you to pour data in and connect with other servers and support for an organization mapping and analytics across an organization. Those are the three big anchors. They all kind of work together. Is this still interesting? I'm always nervous. So this, this architecture is GIS, <coughs> and one of my colleagues said, Jay, Jack, you keep putting more raisins in the muffin, you know, every year, and we have to learn it, and we have to use it, and it keeps evolving along. When is the, the muffin going to get too large? I don't think it will. I think it, what makes it interesting is it's just new innovation that keeps making that happen. But not everybody wants to learn all the raisins or the muffin. Even the culture is different. They want to do land use planning, or they want to do indoor space management, or they want to do um, real-time response, they want to do citizen engagement. So this got us going in this idea of building, not only opening our platform for developers, but also ourselves doing a couple of examples of what I think will happen on top of geospatial infrastructure as it evolves. We call them geo-enabled systems. One is for urban, and I think even this little community here is going to play around with it. This is the idea of putting in projects into a database in the sky and seeing it in reference to the urban um, 3D model of the city. And then also planners putting in plans, zoning plans, land use plans, and, and letting it be seen not only by the planners but by everybody in the city. So up in the upper right-hand diagram you can see, I think it's San Francisco, these different colors on buildings. Those represent different statuses of, of, um, of every building, of every lot. So it's going to revolutionize real-time urban planning because every builder will be able to test their building. Every architect will test their building. They'll see the impact on traffic or, or noise or view sheds in reference to the urban frame. A second corollary and related technology is Hub. This is where the city can open up its data, both as open data, but also as, as maps with initiatives to say, for example, the mayor might want to stop traffic death or might want to uh, address homeless, but they don't have enough staff to do it. So they want to get all the citizens engaged in it, like you would in a community meeting. And so it's a technology to organize communities with digital media, uh, leveraging everything that you can imagine. And the third idea is for taking the concepts of GIS to the indoor space. In talking with your president here this morning, I suggested that you should really do this on campus to find your way around. <laughs> That's not a criticism. Uh, wayfinding or space organization or operations management. And some of you might find this interesting is just to push the envelope and take the very tools that you already have here and have uh, you know indoor positioning so you can walk in the door and the little green dot follows you and you can find your way to to somebody's office easily or there's a new well, whatever. Do you guys like this idea or you're not laughing at my jokes uh, I'm really getting nervous. So I've covered what GIS users are doing around the planet. Um, and there are a lot of them, and they're ambitious, and they're growing this field. 
I've talked a bit about the vision that we are moving from GIS to geospatial infrastructure, a new kind of platform in that space. I've hinted that geodesign is, is an important ingredient. And then I've shared with you some of the glimmers of what we work on in, in, our, in, our, in our development labs to try to push the envelope. Most of what I've shared here is already technology that's out. And so now we're looking at what's next for ourselves um, in engineering. And I, I won't really share that, but I will share this, that ESRI, um, who's been around now for 50 years, continues to take about a, well, uh, about a third of our revenue and pours it into pushing the envelope on R&D. That's basically our commitment to, to our users. Some of you from business backgrounds asked me earlier this morning, what is one of the ingredients of our success? I think it has been taking on this idea of serving our users. So our big ambition is to build great tools that help our users do their work better. So we take all their money and we spend it. It's, it's an amazing organization. Um, and in the process of serving them, we also have the ambition to make a difference with our organization to address some of the greater challenges at, um, at the same time. So I've covered this idea that GIS is, is, is evolving into a, a new stage. It's no longer individual projects or systems. It's becoming an infrastructure that is powerful and it will become a responsive nervous system. And this is going to change things. I mean, it's my only shot at making something big really matter. I think this will happen. It'll reshape how people think, how they do their work. It'll make people smarter because they see content and context of what's happening from climate change down to, you know, grading the backyard of somebody's farm. Uh, this this could be quite impactful. And so as, as geodesign professionals, or I might say just as professionals, for those of you not involved in geodesign, this means the work of individual scientists, individual workers, adding up, connecting, sharing information becomes something, something larger. It means that your content and your collaboration can influence the future. And in many ways, that's what we all yearn to do, isn't it? To make a difference in our lives, whether it's your children or grandchildren or kids or um, saving this or working on that. Um, it's my experience that people really want to make a difference on the future. And I think you now have, unlike me, when I started at your age, you have technical means to create more sustainable solutions. I think managing the human footprint, those very slides I shared, uh, could be done. Conserving nature can be done. Protecting our environment can be done, but it requires clever people that can think and design that into being. So to realize this kind of future it's kind of a sustainable future because right now it, you know, the, the bad news is right now it ain't sustainable. No kidding. You know, I, I hate to be a jerk about this, but nothing, none of my colleagues in the academy or in science around the world believe that this is sustainable. It ain't going to happen. So to realize a sustainable future is going to take more than simply you know, GIS technology, that isn't going to do it. It'll require all of our best thinking, mobilizing, getting our friends to understand it, you know, cutting population in about half, um, saving nature wherever we can possibly do it. It'll take our moral strength, it'll take all of our best ethics, uh, and it's just going to also take a lot of damn hard work, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, it's not comfortable work. Um, and so going all in is the way I describe this. It's the, the message I want to leave you. And I can't convince you about this. This has got to be 
Only you can do that. You can, you can think about it, you know, playing at 100%. I've said that a few times today. Um, I think we all have to play at 100%. We have to go all in. And, and uh, I'm repeating myself now. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this uh, distinguished honor. I will treasure this. Thank you for that. But uh, more importantly, I want to just leave you with, uh, you are playing here at this university with something that's magical. I mean, geodesign, what you're investing in. Your, your president is on board. Uh, the students that I've met, thank you very much for sharing what you're doing today. Um, you, have, you have a real shot at playing, playing this way. And I mean, the motto of this landscape architecture department, somebody told me on the way here, um, what is it again? Inspired work. In inspired work. Grounded, grounded in environmental, environmental and, social and social work. It sounds like geodesign to me, really. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much.